Welcome to Talks at Google. Today is my pleasure to welcome Lenny Abramson for a room. Hello. Applause. Thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. Uh, so do you mind telling us about the film? Well, um, so it's a film based on a novel, the same name by this uh, Irish-Canadian writer called Emma Donoghue. And I like to start with, I, don't, I, I tend to start with a little bit about its more fundamental thematic shape than it's than where it takes place, because otherwise you, everybody goes, oh, no. Um, so for me, it's a film about parenting, and it's a film about being a child, about growing up. Um, but it takes place in a very unusual context, which I think focuses those questions in a very particular way. So it takes place in a locked room for at least half of the film, where um, we have a mother and child. The mother was kidnapped maybe seven years before the film starts and had a child in that situation, which is the one positive thing that's come out of it. And it's about her relationship with that child and how she protects him from the kind of darker aspects of, of, their, of their world. And it's, it's a story that's told from the point of view of the child, for whom this is a normal place, or the, the location of his childhood. And then it tracks these people, these two people, as they get out of the situation and as they try to integrate themselves back into the world. So how did you get involved in the project? I read the novel in 2000 and early 2011. And I, have a, um, I had my little boy at that point was four, nearly four. And so it just it sort of slayed me, the book. I mean, it's very beautiful. It's very moving. And it's very sensitive. Um, and I think something of my own feelings for my kid were you know, overflowed onto the character in the novel. And I was you know, just fascinated by what Emma had done and how she was talking about these really universal things in a situation which would normally just be a bleak, true crime kind of story. Or at worst, it could be a pretty exploitative sort of story. Um, and I thought I, I had two thoughts, which is they were, I want to make this into a film. And quickly followed by, I will never have a chance to make this into a film. <laughs> because the novel had been, um, had, it was a big success, particularly in, in the States. Um, and I think while we were debating it in the office about how we might go about trying to get the rights, somebody said, oh, yeah, Obama was pictured coming out of a bookstore in Martha's Vineyard on his vacation with a copy of this under his arm. And I, we just thought, well, you know, forget it. This is way too, you know, for a production company in Dublin, um, a sort of UK, Ireland, London-based company. Um, and but I just wrote this letter to Emma because I felt so strongly about the book and about how I thought it might work on film that uh, I thought, well, at least I'm going to say what I think. And then she can decide whether, whether there's anything in that. And I wrote this very, very long letter just sort of talking about the novel, what I thought the challenges were, what I thought, how it worked, and how it might be transposed into, into this other medium. And she replied. And that was the beginning of a conversation that went on all the way through the film. You know, we work together very closely in a really lovely collaborative way. Um, and there's a kind of thing in the film industry that you're not supposed to allow authors to adapt their own novels because they're going to be really precious and they, you know, they sweated blood over this. And so, you know, they're going to be awful. It's going to be a nightmare. And, and there are plenty of stories like that. But we just kind of really got on. And I think I just trusted her and she trusted me. And that's how we worked. You just totally stole my next question, just because they do say, you know, it's very tough to work with the screenwriter yeah. who's, you know, it's killing your darlings. And, yes. Um, but it sounds like it was a wonderful process. What were kind of some of the discussion points of, obviously, you're having to tell this story in a different medium. Sure. Um, some things maybe aren't going to translate as well as yeah. the screen. One of the big things I thought was just, you know, Jack's voice is so strong and it's so distinct in the pro style. Yeah. Were you ever like, oh, we can't tell this from, you know, we no, can't do voiceover. We have to do this, or was it just like it has to be this? Well, I think that there were like I think there were various temptations that, and I know some pitches were made to Emma where people said, "Okay, we can use CG, or we can create a kind of like externalize the magic aspect of a child's point of view somehow, or use a very very definite point of view camera. You know, not quite the GoPro, but you know that idea that you literally are in the boys." Head. I, I just felt that all of those things are wrong. They're not native to cinema. Cinema handles point of view in a very different way. You know, it's about, and it's much more fluid. Point of view in cinema is much more fluid. Like in a novel, there's always a voice mediating the story. You know, you're reading it. You're reading it in the narrator's voice, whether that's first person, third person. Even if it changes, you're always sort of with 
somebody. It's a mediated thing. Film, at least in a, in a sense, is direct. I mean, you know, and point of view can shift very subtly. So you can be with a character, and then you can find yourself, in, even in the same scene, tuning into a different character. Just So you have that degree of fluidity. And my view was that with, a ve with some small emphases and, and inflections, you could, and a very small use of voiceover, just to pin you to the boy at a couple of key points, you would still be very much with him, but without um, having to make a huge song and dance of it. And also the advantage in the, no in the film, in a way over the novel, is that it becomes more of a two-hander, because the mother in the novel, she's only really seen through the eyes of the boy. She's this idealized person. And of course, we can imagine what she's really going through, but it's a projection. Whereas we've got a real breathing person in our, in our story. And so part of the thing with the adaptation was to be able to shift between his point of view and then undercut that with what you know she must be experiencing in the same situation. And part of why that's interesting is that that actually is what happens, I think, with all parents and children, albeit in a less extreme way. Like, we turn our faces to our children, we turn one face to our children, which is this, hey, you know, good, great. See, everything is always, you are telling your child with every gesture and facial expression that everything's great. Now, sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're shouting at your child and, you know, in a supermarket and feeling like the worst kind of parent in the entire universe. But in, the, in general, <coughs> you're trying to make them feel safe and, and filter the world for them. And that's sort of what room is a, is a metaphor for. But of course, that filtration is never fully successful. And things do penetrate. And aspects of the household that you're in or if you're kind of, if there's stresses, they will pick it up. And, and moving from childhood to adulthood is a process of the dismantling of that membrane. You know, And it, I think in our film, it just gets dismantled in a very dramatic way. And, and that just helps you think about those things in a, in a more focused way. Sure, it's the stakes are kind of having to explain to your kid maybe why the tooth fairy isn't real versus why their entire existence that they know is not and anything. And it's dangerous. Yeah, it's dangerous and, yeah, and that absolutely. they need to get out of there. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, obviously, two of the most important factors in this film, and it would all hinge on the actors you have playing Jack yeah. and Ma. So how did, um, you know, how did you guys find Brie Larson? How did you find Jacob Tremblay? He was so... He's amazing. Amazing in this. Um, he, yeah, I, he sort of still blows my mind. And I was there, you know. And, and um, I think with Brie, it was one of those things, like if any film works, there are always uh, moments that you look back on which are just pure luck. Because it's such a bizarre medium. It involves so much chaos and uncertainty. And, and uh, the several moments of luck for me. One of them was that when we knew we were really going to make the film, we were starting to think about casting work with a very, very good casting director in London. And we were thinking about a very short list of, of women who we thought could play the mother, because we wanted her to be the right age, which is mid-ish 20s, early to mid-20s. Didn't want to be casting somebody older and doing all the movie stuff that just makes things feel a bit fake. And we had maybe three names. And then somebody in the office, actually somebody in admin in, a, in, admin in the office said, oh, I saw this film called Short Term Travel. It's a really good uh, actor in that. And I. Like, if you make films, two things happen all the time. One is that people come up with scripts. And, um, and the other is that people have casting suggestions. And you learn to smile and nod politely at both and then completely ignore them, right? Um, and uh, I thought, oh, well, great. You know, thank you so much. And then there happened to be a DVD lying around the office. And I took it home. And I just had a bit of time that night. And I watched it. And she's absolutely staggering. Brie is staggering in that film. And she's, she's interesting because she's both dramatically incredibly strong and she can go very deep, but she also has this lightness and she inhabits her characters without any of that showy, you know, tragic heroine intensity that would just kill this film because you've got to believe that she's a real person that would have been on any street in any American town and, and was just unlucky. Um, so I went and I met her and I met a couple of the other people that we were interested in. And she just, yeah, I started a conversation with her in that meeting that we just continued through one audition. And it just felt like I didn't want that conversation to end. you know. And then with Jake, you, when you're casting a child, um, you give yourself a time limit. So if it's a small child, you can't sort of say, well, we'll, we'll cast the child. And then when we know we've got the child, because otherwise, if we don't have the child, we don't have a film. 
we'll then start putting the film together because we know we're okay. Problem is that's going to take you a year and then the child will have changed. So it's this weird, it's like cooking a dinner and trying to get everything to be ready at the same time. You have to get on with the film, uh, you know, setting it up and you get on with looking for the kid. So, uh, and I used to say to Emma, Emma would say, but, but you know, well, what if we don't find the kid? And, and I'd say, oh, you know, you know, there's top professionals working on this. Oh, you know, we do this all the time. But actually, of course, there was this terrible fear that we wouldn't find our boy and that we would have to postpone and all that. And then Jake, put him, he was put on tape by his parents in Vancouver. And I saw his tape, and it was really good. Maybe a little bit. He'd done some commercials and stuff, so there was a little bit of that sweet kind of, you know, bing kind of acting, which, if you, it, which is fine if you're selling... Um, toothpaste or car insurance, but if you put it in a real film, the kid just looks psychotic, you know, that, that sort of way. Uh, so uh, when I went to meet him, met him in um, LA and with a few other little boys, and it's weird auditioning little kids because they're all gorgeous. And, and you don't want to sit there going, yeah, you know, get rid of that one. But, but it's just, it's who fits the thing, you know? And, and Jake had that lovely, uh, he's a very natural kid. His parents are not show busy at all. Um, he loves acting. Uh, and uh, very quickly could see that we, that we could take that layer of sweetness away. And I just wanted to see, can I make him comfortable not pretending? You know, in other words, just sitting there. And what is it, what's it like if I ask him just to sit there and, you know, hold a look and then look away and look back? And that's when you see, does, it, does the, the little guy, when you ask him to do something, does he then do it with a natural kind of comfort, you know? And... He does. Of course, he's still very young, and, and it involved, you know, getting that performance out of him involved s on both sides so much kind of effort, and, and Brie as well, because Brie was so much part of in the scenes. She was really helping him, and she'd sort of she'd say, "Stop kicking your leg against the table," or you know, "Move your hair," or "Remember what Lenny said about this," or she was amazing. And then she'd be able to go right back into her her performance. But Jake has it, and if he didn't have it, we wouldn't. There just would be no film. I'm curious in terms of working with the two actors because Brie kind of has to be in this very horrible, not horrible, but she's, you know, she's a broken down state yeah. versus Jake who in the beginning needs to be kind of just like, hey, the world is what yeah. the world is. Yeah. Did that affect your production schedule at all? Did you guys try and shoot, you know, prep with Brie first and then, and then bring Jake in fresh? Sure. Or? Well, we prep uh, Brie uh, from the moment she was cast. That was about eight months till we shot and I was in contact with her a lot and was over and back to, to California a lot. And... Um, so, and, and talking about the character, because like I say, the character isn't fully formed in the novel, so there was loads of room. And Brie was, but she was getting on with her own prep, and we were talking, and she was getting on, on with her own prep. So she, and she got herself really into the right state of mind by the time we were ready to shoot. But then Jake arrived, and it's just like in the film, nothing will dampen his spirits. I mean, so it doesn't matter how kind of, what she's been going into in preparation, He's going, hey, what's your favorite Star Wars character? And, you know, look, if I hold your nose and you do my, you know, it's just like you can't stop him. He's just a little, lovely little boy. And that was actually really good, I think, for her because it stopped, it, it stopped her being able to sink. She had to come back up and come back up between takes. And there were some lovely moments like, you know, I don't know who's seen the film, but there's a moment where they're reunited at the, after they've been kidnapped. And it's very, very emotional. After they've escaped, it's incredibly emotional. Brie is absolutely you know, it is one of the most, it was an amazing piece of work from her. She's just, she's crying, she's sobbing, and it's real, you know, she's got herself into that state, and I'd call cut. And Jake could go, why are you still crying? You know, Lenny call cut, what's wrong? You know, let's hang out, what, what do you want to eat from the craft service table? <laughs> so, so it was just brilliant, because it just, it kept everybody from taking themselves too seriously. Um, what sort of research did you did you do? Did you have Brie do? Did she kind of take this on her own? Um, I believe Emma had said when she was writing the novel, she didn't get too bogged down yeah. in it just because unfortunately there are so many real life kind of examples of this that you yeah. don't want it to become too much of one story. One, and also you, it's always imaginative, imaginatory, I mean, whatever the word is, because the research brings you a certain distance, you know, can give you a lot of the I was quite interested in small things like, you know, what, how do the police operate afterwards? What do the media do? What are the kind of, what are the beats of all those things? Just so that it feels real. And I found those some footage of, you know, arrivals home to houses really useful. And I read interviews and watched interviews. But the thing about, the thing about it is people don't, you know, none of us speak, unless, you're, unless that's your thing, none of us speak with great 
inside about ourselves. I don't think we do anyway, you know. And people's stories become a bit calcified so that after the, when you see a story, it's sometimes already become a kind of bit of a, a, a patter, you know. So in the end, you've really got to imagine what was it really like the moment when they stepped out. What you know, you've no choice but to do the thing that you always do if you're making a, writing a book or making a film, which is try your best to get inside it using your own, you know, your own resources. But I know, I know, I did, I did, yeah, I did read some of the stuff and watch some of the stuff. I'm particularly interested in the media and how the media exploits those people and what it, what those interviews feel like. And because we were doing one of those interviews in the film, it was a brilliant thing to be able to watch those simpering, deeply concerned, heavily quaffed people who, who make that, you know, who have that dripping sense of deep concern. And you just know that it is, there is a savage ratings getting machine operating under that. So that was it useful to watch. Yeah, that's one of kind of the things I noticed um, that is also pretty prominent in the book where do you think this film kind of would have resonated maybe 50 years ago where we weren't in this 24-7 media cycle where it's almost this like horrific expectation of these people who are victims That's right. to have to participate in an interview and then it's like if they don't people are like well what's wrong with you? you, know, why yeah, you and how dare they be private about it? It's like all the people cheering when they come home. I mean, what makes you think that that's what these people who've just been through this terrible trauma need? I mean, I'm not suggesting that the people cheering don't actually feel something, but everything is a spectacle. And I don't think 30, 40 years ago, you, this, this would be an entirely different film. And you would actually imagine that largely people would keep, and it's, this is also not necessarily a good thing, but people would want to keep it quiet because there'd be perceived shame and, and all that around what had happened. Now, at least that's not there now. Although we are, you know, it's very interesting, you know, that whole idea of how we, how shame operates in, in the public sphere now and, and how, particularly in social media, that, that kind of mob can form really, really quickly. Um, and it's the same, I think, in these cases. People endlessly parse over them, judge the mother. Um, and when she comes out, she is so concerned to show that she's done a good job with the boy. And that's very, I think that's something very sad about that. It is, and I think, I think it's probably one of the cruelest things my understanding is you could say to a parent is like judging them on their parenting oh, yeah. style and saying, totally. you know, well, shouldn't, shouldn't you have done this? It's like, well, you don't know. You weren't in my shoes. That's or, right. I didn't even have shoes. You know? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. in a room. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious about religion just because it is a little more prominent in the book, but I don't think it was missing from the movie, but I'm, I'm curious as to what the decision was in terms of not making it this kind of huge factor. I just them. didn't want it to be, I mean, in a way, I didn't want it to be appropriated by that constituency sure. as that kind of story. I just, and Emma, what Emma did in the novel is she does bring in a little bit of it, and it's, and it's really just, it's Ma's attempt to use whatever materials she's got to make this work for the boy. And I, I felt, well, I don't think you really need this. I'm, I'm myself, I'm not religious, and, and I'm pretty kind of emphatic about that. So. I suppose it's just a personal thing. I, I, she does talk about heaven, but that's a very generic idea. But as soon as you talk about God and Jesus and stuff, um, I, I just, I, for me, it rang alarm bells, and I just didn't want the film being talked about as, because like, I think people should believe whatever they want and be totally free to do that. But in this story, for me, it is the actual love of a mother, which all mothers, or, you know, most people give to their children regardless of whether they're religious or not. And I thought, well, if you could do it without that, then let's do it without it. I definitely kind of enjoyed that it, it made it more accessible to me as also like a non-Christian or yeah, whatever, sure. yeah, where it's, it's, it's just more her appropriating the backstories and mythology she already knows That's as right. opposed to, uh, it, it, you know, making it about a specific... It, it, exactly. Um, so one of, one of the things I, I really enjoyed, and this is just more of a filmmaking thing, was the use of sound and music mm. and then the kind of lack thereof. Yeah. Um, I don't think we even heard music at all until we kind of went to Jack's first... Um, yeah, there's a little bit, but really the first proper score is when we're in his first voiceover. Was, yeah. was that something you knew from the beginning, that you just wanted to be this like cold... No, it, it, the music thing is always organic with me. I work with the same composer who I've worked on, on every, with everything I've done. He did Frank as well, both the songs and the soundtrack. And uh, we've been friends since we were in the Irish equivalent of third grade, like we were nine. Is that right? That's about then, isn't it? And um, 
we always just, it's always a thing that he just starts coming in, starts watching stuff, starts to put pieces against what we're doing, and we see them, and we keep them, or we, we, we lose them. And I, I think I'm always pretty sparing with music, because I think it's, when a film can do a lot of its work just using those very simple tools, that's a, a, a very strong thing. And then when you do use music, it has more effect, because it isn't just this wallpaper that's there all the time. Um, sound, I think it's a really good sound job on this film. We spent a lot of time on it. And just that feeling of opening out, when the door opens and, and you just get this, and you realize that you've been in this kind of vacuum space for, for a while. And then once they're outside and, and Jack is having to deal with the kind of buzz and confusion of the world, there's quite a lot of very good, very subtle sound design that just emphasizes different frequencies and just messes a little bit with perspective in the same way that the camera starts to be um, to, to deconstruct a little bit some of those experiences, like when, when he's with the police and they're asking him questions. In the way that a child does, his, his attention is just as likely to be focused on the badge as the face, you know, or the hat as the face. And, and, um, and, and those are things we didn't really do inside the room where everything is familiar. So, yeah, sound design is a, you know, it's a huge part of it. And just personal grievance is that so many theaters are badly set up and they also play the films really quietly because they don't want, they're used to huge big blockbusters which leak into the cinema, into the theater right beside if it's a multiplex. And so you, half the time when you're watching a subtle film, you're losing a massive amount of its impact because it's not an immersive sound experience. It's just a, it's just a bit too quiet. Um, well, we heard it in, properly and, and Good. the lack of sound, I think, was the thing that was most we heard the least, the most. Um, yeah. um, so I think one of my favorite scenes, personally at least, was when um, they're out and, and Ma or Joy, or uh, she's just like, I want him to connect with something. Yes. Um, you know, and clearly he's actually capable of that and she's not, but I'm, I'm curious as to what you want people to connect with. Like, what's one of the things you want people to connect with most with this film? Um, for me, it's always, and it's a good way of asking it because people usually say, what do you want people to take away? or what ideas do you want them to take away? But I don't think in terms so much of, of ideas, I think there are lots of ideas and it's quite a fertile film for thinking about things via, you know? But um, I think more about experiences and, and a kind of, film is such a, it can be, and especially in the theater, such a kind of completely, I use that word again, immersive experience that it, it, it sometimes allows you to open up a little bit, just very simply about the relationships in your own life. Or, or for me, it's to feel more a different kind of empathy or, a, or a, a, an awareness of other people. And I, for me, it's, it's, I hope that you feel that you've had a very, very intimate encounter with people that you've cared about. And I think through art, those encounters are pure in a way that they can never be in life because it's almost impossible in life to distance yourself from your own requirements or impulses or wants in a given situation. In other words, we're, we're actors in, in our own lives and we can, it's very hard to abstract that. Probably with your own children is the only time where you feel that, you know, that lack of yourself being that important. But, but for me, I think a good piece of film or a humanistic piece of film is one that sharpens your sense of empathy and, and, and does it in this crucible of, a, of, a, of an experience in, this, in the theater. But then maybe you bring that back out and, and it just opens you up a little bit. Um, so my, I think my last question is, and we're going to be taking audience questions if anyone wants to line up. Um, what was the most challenging thing about making this film for you and what was the most rewarding thing? Probably the most challenging was, was, was how do you preserve the the tension in the film after the escape, mm -hmm. because you have a, an escape sequence in the middle of the film, which would normally be the you know the climax of a film, and then you're going to move on into this different sort of question that you're asking in the second half. And I think, in a way, we found just by 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 making something of the anticlimax of the escape, make that the plot point that for an audience goes, oh wait, this isn't. This isn't going to be, there's that realization that it's not going to be what you were hoping for. And also, I suppose, a certain kind of very focused storytelling in the second half, which just creates this, I don't know, just this, this, this tension in, around whether the relationship can survive. And probably the, bit, the most rewarding thing about it was um, actually just feeling the audience's reaction to it. I mean, 
that's not so much about the making, but uh, I've made, you know, this is my fifth feature, and they've all had, you know, they've all, I'm very lucky they've all been well reviewed and have gone to very good festivals. And first two to three were v very art house films, and you get an extremely attached audience for those, but, but it's a small one. And in a big room, for a lot of people, it's just not what they want. And, and I didn't go out making this film in order to, that wasn't the purpose. I didn't want to go out and say, I'm going to make a broad and crowd-pleasing film. I wanted to make the right, the, the film that this should be. But when it turns out that that actually has a, a much bigger audience and that the effect is so emotional, it's sort of amazing. I mean, I, in, in Toronto, I, uh, I didn't go to the screening, but I came, I came at the end, and I heard the, the music start and this absolutely huge response from the audience, and then I walked out, and there was a massive ovation, and uh, that was sort of overwhelming, it was, but it was, it was really lovely. Yeah. Um, do we have any? I feel like it's a shareholders meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, was there any part of the book that you wanted to adapt for the film and were not able to? Yes. The, there were some parts of the book that I really loved. And it, again, in the second half, there's a trip to the shopping mall that they go on. Ma has a brother in the book. We, we, she, he's not there in the film. Um, and they go to the shopping mall, and, and, and Jack is dragged around and doesn't understand anything. And it's all overwhelming. It's a really lovely commentary on the way we live. Um, but in the film, it was only by really focusing the film in this very laser-like way in the second part where you are entirely tracking the relationship with the mother and son. That's, so I shot, I did shoot a shopping mall scene. And, and it's really interesting. And on its own is very interesting. But, and it also took them out of the house at the end. And I felt, no, let's, you know, let's keep this balance. It's one interior to another via this big expansive section, and so I kept it at, at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>